Whether you're an experienced player or a total beginner, here are 50 tips to help you surviving Mars. For your first playthroughs, don't make it too easy. The easy settings in this game are ridiculously easy. You will blitz through the game in no time, the game won't feel challenging, and it really takes away a lot of the fun. For a first playthrough, I'd aim for a difficulty bonus of around 150%. The difficulty bonus is affected by the mission sponsor, the commander profile, the mystery, and the map location you choose. For a first playthrough, I'd recommend playing with a mission sponsor of India, which has uh, three rockets, and a reasonable amount of money and decent research. Choose a commander profile of astrogeologist, which guarantees that you'll start with a rare metal deposit revealed. And then pick one of the easy mysteries, doesn't really matter which. That'll give you a difficulty bonus of around 120. Then select a pretty easy colony site. Now you can select anywhere on the map. There are some suggested sites, which you might want to take a look at. I'd recommend Surinam Beta which is in the southern hemisphere. This has got fairly low threats and pretty high resources. What this means is by starting with relatively low cash but having good resources on Mars, you'll be more inclined to have a self-sustaining colony on Mars rather than just taking the easy route of shipping everything in from Earth. And I guarantee this will give you a much, much more satisfying playthrough. After you've selected your initial settings, you'll be asked to select a payload for your first rocket. Now, don't be afraid to change these because some of the payload suggestions are just plain crazy. I would always suggest that you take an RC Explorer on the first rocket of any mission. The payload for your first rocket is going to depend on several factors, but here are a few things to think about. If you've only got one rocket, then you're definitely going to have to take a moisture evaporator and a fuel refinery with you. Rockets only have fuel for a one-way journey, so in order to get your rocket back, you're going to have to fuel it up. So you need a fuel refinery to generate fuel, and fuel is generated from water, so you're going to need a moisture evaporator, unless you get lucky enough to get water, or you know that there's going to be water where you're going. If you know there's definitely going to be water there, then you could ditch the moisture evaporator and take a drone hub instead. I definitely suggest taking an RC rover and an Explorer on every first rocket. A transport is also a good option, but that can be sacrificed and brought on a second rocket. You can find concrete and metals locally. Polymers, machine parts and electronics are advanced materials, and you can probably afford to wait for your second rocket to arrive to deliver those. But I would take five electronics with you on your first rocket so that you can build a sensor tower, which will really speed up your scanning of the surface once you've landed. I'd finish off this build by adding a few orbital probes so I can scan the surface before I land and make sure that I've picked a good landing site and always add a few drones because they come in really handy. Welcome to Mars, Commander. As soon as you close the welcome screen, your first job is hit the pause button. You can do that by either clicking on the pause button or hitting the space bar. Your colony will be evaluated after 100 days and you'll have tasks to complete before that. So don't waste several days sitting in orbit. You're going to need that time. The second reason for hitting pause is because you haven't got any active research yet. So you're wasting valuable research points. Click on the flask to open up your research tab and select some technologies to research. The order that the techs appear in is random which means that you're going to have to adapt your strategy dependent on which technologies you get first. But it's not completely random. The techs are broken into tiers of groups of five. So this tech, for example, the Earth Mars Initiative, this is a tier one tech. So it will always appear in the first five techs that you research. Techs that appear in tier two will never appear earlier than slot six. You'll always start off with the first five techs unlocked. And you may have some extra ones which have been granted by your initial settings. If you want to see the rest of the tree, just move your mouse to the right hand side to scroll across. As well as the regular techs, there are also breakthrough technologies. These are required by scanning anomalies on the surface of Mars, but we'll talk more about that later. You can queue up up to five technologies at a time. And if a technology is greyed out, then that means that it's already researched. Now it's time to scan the surface and decide where we want to land. Now you can queue up up to five different tiles. They don't have to be next to each other, which will be slowly scanned over time. 
you can see it says scanning 0%. But if you've brought orbital probes with you, you can do instant scans. There are four resources that you want to be looking out for. Concrete, metals, rare metals and water. And probably the most precious of those is water. If you move over a tile, it'll tell you what the chances are of finding those resources in that particular sector. This sector's got a high chance of finding water. This one's got a high chance of water. This one's got a high chance of concrete and metals. Now, that doesn't mean you definitely will find those resources in that tile. It just means that there's a high probability. Okay, now here's a really good tip. If you've chosen the Surinam Beta as a starting location, this crater down here is absolutely jam-packed with water. <laughs> I wasn't kidding. There is 60,000 water in this crater. Actually, there's even more next door as well. And right next door to that, you've got metals and rare metals. And up here, concrete. So a combination of concrete, metals, rare metals, and a whole load of water makes this a really good place for a first-time playthrough. Two more tips before we head down to the surface. Resupply. You go over to this rocket icon, go to resupply. There is no reason you have to wait before sending your next rockets. You could choose another rocket straight away, load it up with whatever you want, and launch it straight away. That rocket is already on the way, so you're saving valuable time waiting for that resupply mission. But just be certain that you've got everything that you need before you commit that last rocket. Lastly, consider taking advantage of any high ground. Wind turbines get a major boost from being on elevated terrain. Here we've got an elevation boost of over 100%, doubling the power output of these wind turbines. It's definitely worth thinking about. It's time to land our first rocket on Mars. As you can see, it kicks up a lot of dust as it lands, and it's going to do the same thing when it takes off. And dust is your enemy on Mars. Dust is what causes buildings and vehicles to need maintenance, and maintenance costs are high. So you want to keep your rockets well away from your buildings. If you chose Asteroid Geologist as part of your starting settings, you'll already be able to rescan sectors with deep scanning that reveals deep deposits and more importantly, more surface anomalies that you can access straight away. Let's rescan these sectors and see what else we can find. Now it's time to put those expensive drones and rovers to good use. Get your explorer and get it researching anomalies. Put down a metals depot straight away. Your drones will automatically collect any surface metal deposits that are within the radius of your rocket. For metals deposits which are outside the radius of your rocket, you've got two options. If you put down a metals deposit and then call your RC rover to somewhere nearby, that will automatically gather resources. The other option is to set up a transport route using your transporter. Select the uh, transport route create button, left click near the deposits because it'll bring resources back from a small area around the point that you select. So let's let's click over here. Tell it what you want to collect. Then left click where you want the resources deposited. Using these two methods you can clear the surface metals from a huge area around your base and accumulate an enormous amount of metal. When your drones have finished collecting resources just use your transporter to move the resources back to base. If a vehicle gets low on battery, you can either charge it up from the base's power grid by just putting it next to an electrical cable, or you can charge it up from another vehicle. You can dramatically increase your scanning speed by using sensor towers. A single sensor tower will increase your scanning rates in adjacent tiles by up to 400% and it speeds up scanning of every sector on the map by 10%. And that tower boost stacks, so if you build five sensor towers, you'll be increasing your scanning speed by 50% on every tile on the map. There are four types of anomaly that you can analyze. The flask will give you bonus research points. The key will unlock new technologies. The magnifying glass unlocks breakthroughs. 
And the eye is kind of a wild card. It can grant you money, research points, and unlock events. Always keep plenty of research queued up. Some of these anomalies can grant thousands of research points. And if you don't have enough research queued up, those points are going to be wasted. Always analyze breakthrough anomalies first. These can be incredibly powerful, game-changing technologies, and you want to get your hands on them as soon as possible. If you have any questions about the keyboard commands, go to Options and Key Bindings. Here you can see all the keyboard controls in the game, and you can set new key bindings. Later in the game, you'll get lots and lots of things pinned to your taskbar, so I suggest hotkeying the unpin function. That'll save you a lot of time. The best place to get information about your colony is in the colony overview screen. And I would strongly recommend keeping this tab open at all times. Here you can find detailed information about the state of your base and the state of your resources. And don't forget that there are extra tabs. Here you can find out detailed information about your colonists. You can access the build menu using this cog and spanner icon down in the bottom left hand corner. But the fastest and easiest way is the right mouse button. You can demolish individual buildings by selecting and then clicking on salvage. But to demolish pipes and cables, you'll have to use the salvage option from the build menu. It's also a much faster way of destroying multiple buildings. You can change the appearance of drones, rovers and rockets. Just select them and cycle through the skins using the paintbrush icon. You can also do it for domes. In-dome buildings are slightly different, and you cycle through the different variants using the square bracket keys. And finally, upgrades. Some technologies will give you upgrades that have to be constructed. Click on a building, and you'll find them in the top right of the building screen. Cable and pipe networks will sometimes malfunction. And the larger the networks are, the more often they'll malfunction. Instead of connecting buildings together on a single network, break it down into smaller networks. It seems that single tile networks never have malfunctions. Using single tile networks, you can also pack things really tightly together, which is great for solar or wind farms. Just remember that although buildings conduct power, they can't connect to each other directly. There must be a power cable in between the two. Another way to reduce your cable and pipe maintenance is to use tunnels for long distances. Tunnels carry oxygen, water and power, and they never need any maintenance. One more tip with tunnels. Even though the two tunnel entrances are treated as one building, the drones will always go to the first tunnel entrance that was placed in order to build it. So bear that in mind when you're placing them down. Universal depots are a great way to create a distribution network for resources around your base. Because your drones and shuttles will do it automatically. But you don't always want everything everywhere. So you can filter these out. Click on the one that you don't want. And boom, no food will be distributed to this depot. When you're spacing out drone hubs, try and make sure that they just overlap each other. That way, they can automatically repair each other if one malfunctions. And the overlap also makes a great place for a universal depot. In the early game, you'll probably only have access to hydroponic farms. But as soon as possible, you want to change over to the regular farm. Farms produce more food, use less water, and don't use power. Three hydroponics farms uses 15 power. That's quite a difference. When you first build a farm, it'll have a soil quality of 50%. You can increase that up to 100% by planting crops that improve the soil quality. Initially, you can use soya beans, which increase the soil quality by 10% each crop. And once you've researched GM crops, you can grow one lot of cover crops, which will increase it by 40%, and then one lot of soya beans to take it up to 100. So, what are the best crops to grow? Well, if you want maximum production, then go for a crop rotation of potatoes and soya beans. That will bring you in an average of eight food per day, or eight food per sol. Wheat, on the other hand, produces seven food per day, 
but it does use less water and you get a crop every two days as opposed to every five days with the potatoes and soya bean. So you've got to really take a look at your colony and see what's going to suit you best. So after you've researched GM crops, what's the best late game food? Well, it's the same situation with um, quinoa replacing wheat and corn and fruit replacing potatoes and soybeans. But this one is easier for me. I think just go with quinoa. Quinoa only produces slightly less food than a combination of corn and fruit trees. And fruit trees take eight days to grow. And that's too much chance of a, a boom, bust, feast or famine situation for me. So I prefer to have my quinoa coming in. I only lose a tiny amount of production. It's like half a food per day compared to the corn and fruit trees. And you're guaranteed that harvest every two days and you're saving water. Okay, let's talk about resources and extractors. Extractors are kind of like rockets. They produce a huge amount of dust. So keep them away from your buildings because they'll really up your maintenance costs if you don't. Each resource deposit will tell you how much of the resource is available and also the grade. Now don't confuse grade with yield. The grade tells you roughly how much you're gonna get per day and that can range from very low to very high. So let's see, how does that actually affect production? If we look at this extractor over here, this is working on a very low grade resource and it's producing 8.7 metal per day. Whereas on a high grade resource, it's producing 17.4. So I think about it this way, if an extractor extracts say 100 tons of ore per day, if it's low grade, it might only get one ton of metal out of that 100 tons of ore. But if it's very high grade, it might get 10 tons of metal out of that 100 tons of ore. Extractors don't have to be placed directly on top of a resource deposit. They just have to be within their area of influence. And that means that you can have multiple extractors extracting from one deposit. In fact, if you want to take it to extremes, you can have at least eight working on a single deposit. Your production buildings will usually have the ability to run three shifts, with the exception of the farm, which only runs one shift per day. If you need to increase the output of a particular building, there are a few things that you can do. First of all, you can add in extra shifts. Second, you can increase or decrease the priority in order to encourage or discourage people from working at that factory. The other way you can control how many people work there is by restricting the number of work slots available in any particular shift. But be careful about having people working night shifts. Workers will lose sanity if they work during the night shift. The other thing that you can do to get a temporary boost is implement heavy workload. Working a heavy workload will increase the performance of the building but it inflicts sanity and health penalties on the workers. So be careful about using that and perhaps don't use that as a permanent solution. The other way to improve performance is to have the right people working in the right jobs. So here we've got all engineers working in this electronics factory. The best workers for that factory are engineers. But how do we make sure that there are engineers in this dome to fill this job? Well, if you go to the dome, you can filter by traits. So you can select what job specializations you want in that dome. So in this dome, I said, I definitely don't want scientists in this dome. And of the rest, I prefer engineers. You can also use your shifts to balance your power demands throughout the day. So for example, our machine parts factory uses 50 power per shift. Our electronics factory uses 28 and our polymer factory uses 22. So we might have the machine factory running in the morning and then have the electronics factory running in the afternoon along with the polymer factory. And that would mean we've have a, we have a consistent demand throughout the day of 50 power in the morning and also 50 power in the afternoon. The final tip in the production section is beware the double whammy. And that is having people working a night shift in an out of dome building. For non-Martian born, the penalty is huge. This guy is getting a minus 10 penalty for working during the dark hours 
and a minus 10 penalty for working outside the dome. This guy is almost insane. And it's not that much better for Martian born. For Martian born, it's minus five and minus five, but it's still gonna take a toll in the long run. Don't get caught out by nurseries. In Surviving Mars, a nursery is not a type of school, it's a type of residence. Children don't need to live with their parents, so consider creating a kids-only dome. Nurseries hold eight children each, and a school with a night shift enabled holds 15. So a ratio of two nurseries to one school works out really well, and you can fill it up with a few extra playgrounds. Similarly, youths are not children, they're young adults. They're able to work and they're able to work in any building. The Martian University doesn't have any age restrictions. Anybody who is unspecialized can be trained at a university. So don't think that it's just restricted to either youths or kids. So you want to keep the dust off your solar panels, but you haven't researched the triboelectric scrubber yet. Well, how about putting them inside a dome? And yes, this absolutely does work. Okay, this is a spacing tip. If you take a subsurface heater and then take some moisture evaporators and place them so that they just surround the heater. Once it's all built, increase the service area by one notch. That'll cover all three buildings. Now this costs 6.4 power. During a cold wave, this will save you nine power just on the moisture evaporators. You can now fill the area inside here with water towers, oxygen tanks, moxies, and anything else you fancy. And finally, get lots and lots of shuttles. Why? Because they look freaking awesome. All right, guys, that's it for my top 50 tips for surviving Mars. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit the like button or leave me a comment. Thank you for watching. I'll catch you for the next one. Peace out.